On the course, we've covered how to use some of the built-in validators in Angular. And in this lecture, we're going to start talking about how to create your own custom form validators. By the end of this lecture, you're going to know how the built-in validators work in both the model-driven and template-driven forms. And you're also going to know how to create a basic hard-coded custom validator, again for both the model-driven and template-driven forms. Now we have a few built-in validators in Angular. We have the required, the min length, the max length, and the pattern validator. And we can use these validators in, well, two ways. The first way is as functions that we pass into the form control constructor in model-driven forms. And the code in front of you right now creates a form control with a required validator function attached. And the second way is as directives in template-driven forms. So these required min length, max length, and pattern attributes are actually already part of the official HTML specification. By that, I mean that the required attribute here, this, even if you're not using Angular, this will be valid. They are a core part of HTML and we don't actually need Angular in order to use them. If they are present in a form, then the browser will perform some default validation all by itself. However, we do need a way for Angular to recognize their presence and support the same validation logic in our Angular forms. By that, I mean just because we've added the required tag, the required tag to the input control, we need a way for Angular to recognize that the required tag has been added and to add a required validator to an Angular form. Now, if you remember, template-driven forms are just model-driven forms, but with the creation of the model driven by the template. They still have an underlying model. Therefore, just like a model-driven form, we need to attach a validator function to the underlying model form control. And Angular does this secretly by creating special validator directives, which have selectors matching required, min length, max length, and pattern. Let me actually show you the Angular code that I'm talking about. So if we look between lines 59 to 81, we're actually going to find the required validator directive. And if you look at the selector, it's going to match on the required attribute, but also it will only match if there's a required attribute and a form control name attribute or a form control attribute or an ng model attribute. So only if one of those three situations are present will it actually attach this directive. And then if you actually look deeper into the validate function here, you can see that underneath it all, is still calling that validators.required function exactly the same one that we're using when we do model-driven forms. So that's how the built-in validators work. We have an underlying validation function, uh, which is used for model-driven forms, and then we have a directive that we create, which hopefully reuses that same model-driven form validator um, but essentially, we need to create a directive in order to use the same validator in a template-driven form. So in this lecture, let's try and create our own custom validator that works with both model and template-driven forms. Now, let's start off with a model form validator. Now, validators at their core are just functions. They take as input a form control and then return either null if it's valid or an error object if it's not valid. Now for the application that we're going to be working with right now, it's actually the same application, a very similar application that we worked with in the section on forms. So we have a very simple form with first name, last name, email, password, and language. And I want to create a custom email validator, which only accepts emails on the domain codecraft dot tv so what we need to do is we create a function i'm going to create a function called 
email domain validator. Now the function is going to take as a first parameter, as the only parameter, a control, the control that we are attaching the validator to. Let me first grab the email from the value property of the control. And then I'm going to check to see if we have a valid email present. So I'm first going to check to see if it's undefined and if it already contains an at character. Then I'm going to split the email on the at character and see if I can extract the domain. Now, just a quick note here, I'm using some array destructuring syntax here. So we're actually just storing the domain value in its own variable rather than as, a, as an array index. And then if the domain is not equal to codecraft.tv, I'm going to return an error object. So the error object I want to pass in is just this one. So it's going to return an object with a property of email domain. And it's going to pass in some useful data. So it's going to say the actual domain that I managed to parse in on the parsed domain property. And if we reach this point, then everything's fine. The email domain validator has passed. So I'm going to return null. Now this is a model driven form. So in order to use this validator, we simply pass it to the list of validators that we've already passing on the email form control. So on the email form control, we're passing in the required validator and the pattern validator. So to add in the email domain validator, we just pass in the name of the function. Now, no, we're not calling the function, we're passing the function as uh, another item in the validators array. And just like other validators, let's add a helpful message to the user if the validator fails so they know how to fix it. So if we go back into our template form, so if you go up here, here we go. So I want to add another helpful message at the bottom of our other list of messages. So we're already showing a message if it fails a required validator. Again, we're also saying showing a message if it fails a pattern validator. I also want to show a message if it fails the email domain validator. Now the key thing here is that this errors object is actually a concatenation of all of the responses from all of the validators. Now going back up to the top, our validator is returning something with a key of email domain. So if the errors object has the key email domain, it's failed the email domain validator. So that's what I'm going to check. So if I go back down into the validation error messages here, I'm going to say if password errors, email domain, that means the email domain validator is failing. I'm going to add a message that's going to tell them to please use the codecraft.tv domain. So email must be on the codecraft.tv domain. So now if I rerun our application, so let me go to the email field as I start typing in. If I type in Gmail, before I do that, I need to fix an error in my code. It should be email errors and not pattern and not password. So now if I run the application, I type in asim. Now it's giving me the initial validator that the pattern validator is failing as soon as I put in at. And now my email domain validator is failing. And if I type gmail.com, it doesn't like it. But if I wrote code craft.tv, everything's fine. So that's how we can create a validator for use in a model driven form. Uh, next up, we'll look at how we can repackage our validator function for use in a template driven form. Now to do that, I have another plunker. This one shows exactly the same form, but this form is actually template driven versus model driven. So if we go into the template logic here, you can see it's using things like a two way binding with ng model. We're applying the validators via template tags. And we're grabbing a reference 
to the form, a template reference variable to the form using the ng form directive there. So to use our validator function in a template driven form, we need to do two things. Like number one, we need to create a directive and attach it to the template form control. And number two, we need to provide the directive with the validator function on the token ng validators. So firstly, let me copy across the validator function that I created for the model driven form. I've got it here. Let me copy it across to the other plunker. This is the template driven form. Okay. And then next up, we're going to start creating our directive validator. So underneath our function here, I'm just going to create a class called email domain validator. I'm going to decorate it with our directive decorator and I'm going to give it a selector, a selector which says email domain and ng model. So if a template form has an ng model attribute already attached to it and an email domain attribute attached to it, then use this validator. And the next thing we need to do is we need to provide our email domain validator function on the token ng validators on this directive. So let me show you. So first off, we're going to provide it. So we need to add a providers property. What are we going to provide? Well, the token is something called ng validators. So this is a list of all of the validators that we have in Angular. Now, in order to use ng validators, we need to import it. So let me go to the top of the file. And it comes from the Angular forms module. So just make sure you've imported it. How are we actually going to provide it? Well, we're going to use the use value mechanism. So use value. And what are we going to provide? The actual thing we're going to provide is the email domain validator function. And another property that we're going to add is something you haven't seen before. It's something called multi and I'm setting it to true. So this provider is a special kind of provider called a multi provider. Multi providers return multiple dependencies as a list for a given token. So now if we actually try to resolve the ng validators token, we're going to get a list of validators returned as a result. And by setting multi is equal to true, we're basically saying, hey, look, append this validator to the list of dependencies that are associated with the ng token. So our directive here really is just a way to link an attribute on a form to a validator function. There isn't, in this instance, there isn't actually any functionality inside our email domain validator directive itself. Okay, but in order to use a directive, we need to add it to our ng module declaration. So let's do that. Let's add it at the bottom there. And then finally, we need to add this to our template form control. So if we go up to where we have our email form control, which is here, and after the required and pattern validator attributes, I'm going to add the email domain attribute, which is then going to associate the email domain validator with this input control. So now if I rerun the application, I just have a little bit of an error in my code. I should have wrapped this in an object. It's an array of providers right here. And the very last thing we need to do is to make sure that we have the same error message being printed out when we have a problem. So let me just copy and paste the one from the model driven form because it shouldn't be any different. Let me put that here. And now everything should be working. So if we rerun the application, 
and then I start typing asim and then the email must be on the codecraft.tv domain and then if I type codecraft.tv everything's fine and it all passes. So in summary, a validator in Angular is a function which returns null if a control is valid or an error object if it's invalid. For model-driven forms, we create custom validation functions and pass them into the form control constructor. But for template-driven forms, we need to create validator directives and provide the validator function to the directive via dependency injection. And through some careful planning, we can share the same validation code between the model-driven and template-driven forms. Now the validator we created in this lecture hard-coded the domain, the domain of codecraft.tv. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how we can make our validators configurable with different domains.